So I will just quickly introduce myself and our Save Barnegat Bay team and then turn it over to our jellyfish education coordinator uh, to take over. So uh, my name is Grace Ann. I'm the educator here at Save Barnegat Bay. I've had the privilege of working here for five years and we have an amazing supportive staff, all of which are here. All the mission staff are here today, which I'm thrilled about. So we have the captain of our ship, Greta Forsberg, the executive director and primary advocate. We have Avery Lentini, the executive assistant um, and super, hooper, super duper helper. And then we have uh, Brittany, our jellyfish education coordinator, who's gonna introduce Julie here in a second. And just a quick uh, few things, this Zoom is being recorded and it will be posted on our YouTube channel for our book club event. And it is being streamed live on Facebook. So if anyone has questions in either location, please make sure to drop them in the chat or in the comments. And uh, you are welcome to unmute yourself. We love to be interactive here at Save Barnegat Bay. If you do have a question, otherwise stay muted so that we don't cause feedback. And uh, yeah, let's get started. So Brittany, would you do the honors of introducing our special guest? Yes, thank you, Grayson. Can everyone hear me okay? Okay, awesome. Sorry, I have uh, earbuds in, so I want to make sure. But um, as Grace Ann just said, my name is Brittany McLaughlin, and I am the part-time jellyfish education coordinator with Save Barnegat Bay. And I mostly uh, learn and work under Grace Ann, the education and outreach coordinator. Uh, so Save Barnegat Bay has kind of been jellyfish month uh, accidentally. So <laughs> we released a podcast episode uh, called uh, based on our Stop the Sting campaign. Uh, you could stream that on Spotify, I think Apple Podcasts, and Anchor, if you want to take a listen. It's about 30 minutes and just talks about our Stop the Sting campaign. Um, our uh, show is called Drift the Podcast, too. So if anyone didn't know that yet on our call and wanted to give it a listen, check it out. I'm biased, but I think it's great. Um, <laughs> and we also launched our scrubbing program that is part of our Stop the Sting campaign. So we were out last weekend and this weekend with uh, Berkeley Township Underwater Search and Rescue Squad. They're an all volunteer dive team who has been scrubbing bulkheads in Berkeley Shores for the past two kind of cold uh, week Saturday, Saturday days. So that's been really fun. And we dedicated our book of the month to jellyfish as well. So all that being said, um, it is my honor to introduce uh, Judy Burwald. She is a very talented writer with a PhD in ocean science. She has written textbooks and articles from magazines such as National Geographic, The New York Times, Nature, Oceanus, and more. And she is also the author of two books. Um, one is titled Life on the Rocks, and the other book uh, is the one we are all excited to talk about today, Spineless. So without further ado, Thank you so much, Julie, for taking some time today to uh, talk all about jellyfish with us. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Um, it's so, thank you so much for, um, yeah, thank you for the amazing introduction. And thank you for inviting me to be part of this. You guys are, I mean, it's really funny. Um, when I first started working on jellyfish, uh, and if you've read the book, you know this, but like one of the first things I did was like just make myself a Google alert for like for jellyfish. And so I started it would it would bring in all the like any article that had anything to do with jellyfish during the day. And then it would show up in my um, inbox, like right before the end of the school day when my right before my kids would come home from school and Barnegat Bay started showing up like early on. And I'm like, what? Is, where is Barnegat Bay? You know, and I so you guys have been like famous to me for years now. <laughs> so, so there is, um, so I, I, when you reached out to me, it, it felt like, you know, kind of like it needed to happen. I don't know. <laughs> like it had been, it had been, um, it had been. So, uh, one, I don't know. It's funny because I don't know how many of you have read the book and if you would prefer, I, um, we can we can take a quick survey and the I can change the view and if everyone wants to either put raise your hand physically in the air or put an emoticon on the corner of your screen to say if you did or didn't read the book, do we give Julie? Um, yeah, and so the other thing, like so, one of the things I I often do, um, I, I have written all these limericks around about jellyfish, <laughs> and so so sometimes um, 
I do these limericks and, and basically the deal is it's like, wait, wait, don't tell me if you've ever listened to that show where um, I'll say the limerick and then whoever can chime in sort of the last word of the poem and then I can talk about the sort of jellyfish science that goes along with that. Um, some of it may not be news to you guys if you're, because it sounds there's way more jellyfish knowledge in this podcast than, I mean, in the Zoom crowd than usual, but um, it might be fun for you to know the answers anyway. <laughs> so I, I'm happy that's kind of like something I, it's kind of fun to do with a group and we can start there. Um, but if, if I want to leave time if you have questions about the book for me to answer those questions also. Um, does that I think, I think that sounds like a lot of fun. And just okay. to, uh, in case you haven't figured it out yet, Dr. Paul Bologna, our local jellyfish expert is here online with us which we're super excited about because the, the, the wonderful magic that will be the two of you talking about jellyfish science is something that I've been very much looking forward to. So, yeah. Awesome. Well, I'm a little bit nervous, but... Um... No, because I, I have started your book several times and I've never actually gotten all the way through it. So you know I am what? going to... I, I, but, you know, it, it's like one of those things, you know, you start it... And then it's just like, oh my God, all the other millions of things like are weighing down, like put it aside. I got papers to read. I've got papers to grade. I've got this, that, and the other thing. And then, you know, it, it, the, then all of a sudden six or seven months goes by and you're like, oh my gosh, already, we're already, I'm going on two days vacation kind of a thing. Let me grab it. And then, you know, the same sort of putting out a fire before you, you know, you open three pages and then some other fire comes. So I, I will apologize dramatically for not having no, no, no. but wait didn't i meet you in barcelona you did and actually yes. dina, who <laughs> is right there with uh, and dina too her little baby that's yes. her little, uh, she's in your book she's in my book because she she had the most brilliant project student project i'd ever heard and it had to go in there <laughs> yeah that's so cool that's so cool. So for um, you, if you just want to talk about that really quick, Dina was the only one who from Barnegat Bay who is referenced in the book. So if you just want to give everyone a tidbit about what the heck that was about, that would be cool. Do y'all want to talk about it? Or do, no. do you want me to talk? From you, I, I mean, um, I, yeah. Well, so, well, so, one, so the book is structured, and I'm not sure, um, it, it, might, it might be obvious, but the book is structured well, for a long time, I didn't know how to structure the book. I'll say that. And one of the hardest things about becoming like a creative nonfiction writer was really learning how to write creative nonfiction. I started off with, you know, in the science side, but when I sat down to write this book, I really wanted to write a book that like everybody would read, not just scientists. And um, it was really important to me that I kind of actually took after the podcast idea where there's information but then there's something fun to like propel you along and want to keep reading and I always had in mind my sister as like my reader who is a very very smart creative curious person but she didn't she never cared about science that's just not her deal she's a business person and so um so the book has uh so the book goes back and forth between science and sort of like the stories of my very bad boyfriend I had in graduate school. And then, um, but it also, like the structure of the book was something I was, I was always struggling with because there's a lot of jellyfish science and I didn't know how to kind of put it in. And then towards the end, like after I had been writing the book for a few years, I realized, oh, you know what? The jellyfish life cycle itself is an awa amazing way to structure the book. And so, um, most of y'all, you guys probably know this, but the life cycle of the jellyfish is on the wall behind me. But um, essentially it starts off as a little baby, I guess, well, it's got, you can maybe see. So it starts off as a little baby planula, which is like a tic-tac, a furry tic-tac. And so the first chapter of the book is kind of like the idea for the book, just like the planula is sort of like the idea of a jellyfish. And then, um, and then what happens is in a jellyfish life cycle is that the planula plants itself down and establish and and lives for you know lives plants itself permanently and grows into a polyp, and that polyp 
uh, stretches out its tentacles into the world, kind of like a sea anemone does. And that's its, that's its sort of experience with the world. So the next section of my book is me sort of planted here in Texas, but I'm stretching my tentacles out into the world to all these different scientists and experts on jellyfish science and trying to understand more about jellyfish science. And um, so the whole, that section of the book is it's kind of scientific, um, but it's also kind of me like figuring out what are these amazing creatures. And then I sort of have this moment where about halfway through the book where I just realized like, I'm never, I gotta get out and feel like, first of all, what are we doing to our oceans? Like we are really messing them up and we are not paying attention to what's happening out there. And, and, um, and so jellyfish go through this also kind of like major, like cracking open realization moment. And, and it's, it's called strobilation for them. For me, it was called depression, but like <laughs> essentially they slice themselves horizontally into like a stack of pancakes. And then each one of those pops off and becomes a little young Medusa, which is called an Ephira stage. And so I have this moment of like great realization where like my whole thoughts about what I'm doing, writing this book kind of break open. And um, so that's the strobilation section. And then the Ephira section, I like head off into the world and I had, I go to Japan to see the giant jellyfish. Um, I see jellyfishing. I kind of try to go out into the field and, and see what's really happening in the oceans. And then the Medusa stage is the mature jellyfish stage. And at that point I go to Israel, which is where my whole marine biology experience started. And, but I go back more mature and try to understand really why, um, why I got into marine biology in the first place. And then the very last section of the book is called Bloom, and that's the Barcelona section. <laughs> and that's when I met you guys. And so in Barcelona, I sort of have this, I, I realized that like, um, well, I don't realize, but I, I, I see, I get to see and experience the sort of energy around jellyfish that it, it actually, it felt like it changed from the very beginning. It took me six years to write this book. The, the actual um, people paying attention to jellyfish science, the field itself really bloomed and has continued to bloom in these last few years. And a bloom is what we call a big collection of Medusa, which you guys experience, I know. <laughs> so anyway, so that's kind of like um, what happened in that, that meeting in Barcelona. There were like 400 jellyfish scientists there from all over the world. And the topics just spanned, like, didn't you guys feel like it spanned like from top to bottom of what you can think about of jellyfish. There was toxicology, there was jellyfish microbiomes, there was a lot of taxonomy, like how many species of jellyfish are cryptic that we don't even know exist. And then also like citizen scientists getting involved in jellyfish research. Um, and jellyfish scientists from all over the world looking at all of these problems. So it does feel like the field has has really grown, um, at least in the last 10 years since I've been looking at it. So I don't know, do you guys want to make a comment on that, that piece of it? So I, I, I'll, I'll chime in only because I, I you know, my experience is, is a little bit crazy. So while I was a, a doctoral student down at uh, University of South Alabama, I was down at Dauphin Island and, and Monty Graham um, <laughs> was a new faculty member at, at, at Dauphin Island. Um, and uh, so that's where, where I first met Monty. Now I, I'm a seagrass guy. That's most of my career has been spent in seagrasses. Um, and so uh, a lot of my initial um, interactions with Monty was he would be yelling at me um, because when I was burning my grass, the, the HVAC system in the building didn't work correctly. So I would light it on fire in the muffle furnace, like huge clouds of like black soot and smoke would come <laughs> through the system and would blow into his lab. Um, so I had to wait till like 5.30 or six o'clock until he left before I could put my stuff in to start burning. Um, and that was, you know, mid nineties. So, you know, I'm a seagrass guy and then I don't get into jellyfish till like 2010. And it's more of a student and, and working in, in Barnegat that sort of opens it up for like the last decade for me. Um, and, and so thinking about sort of Monty's initial struggles back in the mid nineties for anybody to care about what he was doing. I mean, it was about, you know, 
fisheries and management and and thin fish and how do we nobody was really paying attention to to jellies and so many aspects of it and then you start to get the big giant blooms and then people's attitudes begin to change right uh, because right. they're destroying the fisheries um and that now sort of catapults so many of those scientists into more prominence because of that interaction of them sort of eating and then you know we get the comb jellies invade the Baltic and and invade the Mediterranean and the Black Sea and completely devastate the fisheries in, in those aspects. And then all of a sudden it really takes a big global perspective, at least in my mind, those are some of those big steps that really push it at a global level. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, I mean, that's, yeah. I think you're, you've totally hit it on the head. And what's interesting, I feel like, is sort of mainstream wise, it even lagged behind the science, right? Like hardly anyone really knew about what was happening in the Black Sea with the comb jellies because the Soviet Union was collapsing. So like <laughs> that really, you know, sucked all the energy out of the news. But otherwise, you know, an entire like Turkey's fishery completely was obliterated and certainly the news would have covered that, but there were more important things going on. So, yeah. I appreciate it and how parts of the book you really were able to tie in the historical moments to, to how it affected jellyfish science. I, I thought that was so interesting in that, like, that, you know, there were scientists that, you know, had to suffer through being persecuted in World War II that, you know, had they, you know, thank goodness they were able to hide out basically, right? Or else they wouldn't be able to complete, what'd you say, something like seven to 10 papers came out of that individual in that time of that person being hidden away. You know, there's just all these political things and historical, like uh, the bombs in Japan, all these historical things that were going on that affected something we didn't expect was going to be so important by now, I guess. Yeah, I mean, science is never done in a vacuum, right? Like history always plays a role in science and um, culture plays a role in science. I, I feel like that was one of the most important things about, um, one of the things I've, I, I'm kind of glad you brought that up because as I wrote the book, I really felt like I wanted to share, share the way that science, even me as a person, when I was a scientist and all scientists, you know, they fall in love, they have children, they have a bad boyfriend, whatever it is, like, you know, you're not just a scientist in this light white coat. And I feel like um, in our world, there has been sort of this like scientists are over here and they're set apart, but no, scientists are, are people and they have, make good decisions or bad decisions and have emotions and and do all these things that people do. And, and so um, that was, that it's definitely part of, of what I, I felt like I, I needed to um, include in the story of the book. But I guess I went all over the place with that <laughs> little answer. <laughs> it's wonderful. And I guess I'm, I want to steer the conversation a little bit into the Barnegat Bay area, of course, because that's the thing yeah. that everyone here is so excited about, or I would think, anyway. Yeah, um, what is happening? Tell me about it. <laughs> <laughs> so... I'm really not the one on this call equipped to do it, but I'll do it quickly. Um, just that, uh, you know, obviously eutrophication is causing a lot of problems for estuaries around the world. That's not a unique problem. Eutrophication is the overabundance of nutrients in a system. And then the increased amount of infrastructure, which you reference in the book, I was very happy to see that, um, you know, in these coastal areas, infrastructure of plastic and, and hard surfaces encourages these um, polyps to find places to reproduce of uh, this, you know, these jellyfish species. And then the jellyfish are well adapted to low oxygen water, you know, all the things you know already. And then, um, you know, there's these blooms. Well, in Barnegat Bay, particularly, we have these lagoon communities. So there's these mazes of home developments that have, you know, these lagoons that go right up against all these homes so that people can have boats next to their homes. And they're just incubators for these uh, nettles. And then, you know, you reference power plants being clogged in the book as well. And while I haven't heard of that happening necessarily as a problem for the Oyster Creek nuclear power plant, I do know that Paul and others are working on trying to understand what the decommissioning of the power plant is going to do to the populations of jellyfish and how 
it could shift which species live where. Um, so, uh, you know, again, Paul is more obviously in, I'm basically regurgitating what Paul has taught me over the years. <laughs> so um, there's basically nettles in the north and comb jellies in the south as far as their um, abundance. And so, uh, it, you know, Paul expects to see that things will start to shift as the power plant is not basically vacuuming everything out of the central part of the Barnegat Bay because um, the Oyster Creek nuclear power plant had the capacity to filter the Barnegat Bay within three days. The volume of the bay, it, it obviously wow. hydro, hydrology, you know, hydrology comes into play here, obviously, but the, the fact is that the volume of water going through the power plant was that much. Wow. Um, so it, it turning off is going to be something to consider. But other than that, um, you know, we're working on a project with Paul, Save Barnegat Bay, Berkeley Township Underwater Search and Rescue, and a local high school that does marine science and education and, and research to try and slow down and possibly mitigate the overabundance of bay nettles. So the um, Chrysiora chesapeake specifically, which is often confused for the sea nettle. Um, mm -hmm. How'd I do, Paul? Very good, very good. <laughs> um, um, so, so in terms of, you know, the, you know, these lagoons, poor water quality, low oxygen, again, all those jellies doesn't, doesn't affect them at all um, to any degree. So a, a lot of the fouling surfaces can easily be, you know, covered in these polyps. And so that one project that um, we're working on is, can you sort of, you know, scrape your bulkheads in your docks? Can you sort of power wash and get them cleaned off to sort of disrupt that life stage? And we're always talking about the fact that, you know, yes, adults are bad, it's what stings us, but it's that polyp stage, that's the ones that overwinter, that's what makes you next population. And so if you want to affect jellies, you have to somehow disrupt the polyp life cycle. And have you seen like impact in, with your cleaning projects? This is this is year one. We okay. Started this fall, so we don't know for sure. Okay. Uh, we're, we're hoping it's going to. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, but with the with the power plant, um, one of the things like right, the so the way that it's structured is there's Forked River and Oyster Creek, and they basically suck up. They used to suck up the water from Forked River and reverse the the stream itself oh. um, to go through the plant. Um, but right in the middle of it is one of these lagoon communities that is just chalk loaded of jellies. Um, and so for decades, I think it just sucked them up into the plant and killed them at the ephiral stage and there just weren't a whole lot. Um, now that that's not happening, my expectations are that we might start to see just more, just pulse out into the middle of the bay because they're not going to be sucked up um, through the power plant. Um, so we might be expecting more nettles to show up in the bay proper um, just because they're not being destroyed through the plant. Um, and have you guys like been able to identify the polyps in the field? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. They're easy. Oh, seriously? Oh, yeah. They're, oh, wow. they're, they're, they're big and you can see them. Um, we also do DNA swabs. So uh, Dina was involved with that. Uh, right. Jack Gaynor, who's our, our, my, my, the colleague, the molecular colleague. Um, one of the things that we do is we do doc swabs. So we actually just look for the DNA specifically for the bay nettles. Um, and we amplify that and that kind of lets us know the presence at least within the system. Um, so yeah, those are easy. Uh, the, 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 the polyps that I can't find are the clinging jellies. Oh, yeah. I've so, seen articles about that, too. Those yeah. are bad, right? Bef wait, yeah. wait, wait. Before we get on to, I'm sorry, okay. the wrong button here, because there's a really important thing you said, Paul, that I, I want to get to clinging jellyfish, too. But you said you can see them. When you say that, do you mean under a microscope of a low magnification or with the naked eye? Because I've been teaching people that you can't see them with the naked eye. <laughs> I can see them with the naked eye because I know what I'm looking for. Um, and, and so that's a little bit different. But they're, I mean, they're relatively large. So if I've got them growing on a plate, I can, you can see them visually. They're, they're large enough to see without a microscope. 
How about in the, if you're diving, can you see them diving? I, you know, I haven't, uh, again, yeah. I, I've been, uh, I, I've had things to do on the last two Saturdays while they were out <laughs> scrubbing. Um, so, so I have yet to be there in the water to, to kind of see that process and to climb yeah. underneath and actually look at it. Um, it, it it's hard to know. I, I would suspect that somebody like me, if you had good lights and decent visibility, I could probably spot them. Um, or, you know, uh, again, at, at this stage, you'd, you'd look for a whole pile of pot assists, sort of their, their mm -hmm. open wintering resting spots. That's what I would be looking for, um, is, is all those sort of circles all kind of conglomed together or in a line or something that would indicate that that's where they are. Yeah. Wait, do you want to, for a second, Paul, will you describe what a pot assist is? Because that's like super cool. So um, <laughs> among the amazing things with jellies is that they clone themselves like crazy. And one of the ways that they clone themselves are these, what, what we call, what are called pot assists. They're just sort of like they're resting. Um, somebody once explained it to me, and I think it's the best description for at least the, the bay nettles. They look like little slice, thick slices of sweet potatoes. So they're sort of orangish brown and they're sort of circular. But what will happen is the polyp kind of like, you know, sits itself down and then at its base, it creates one of these little slices and it sets it down and then it sort of moves over and it sets down another one and it moves over. So as it's eating and, and doing everything else, it's just setting down lines and lines and lines um, or, or spheres are around them of these pot assists. And all those things are doing is they're resting. They're gonna wait and they'll overwinter. And then when the conditions are good in the spring, they'll sort of pop out and little polyps will emerge from them. So, you know, one single polyp might produce 25 to 30 pot assists in a season. So that one larva that settles and turns into a polyp can be 30 polyps the following year. Um, and that's what, you know, really is the problem um, that those polyps just, you know, grow like crazy and close. And, yeah, and what and what I think I didn't say when I was doing the quick life cycle of the jellyfish is like when they strobilate, a single polyp can become again like a dozen. How many for? I don't know many. How many for your nettles? But um, probably six to twelve. Six to twelve. Medusa. Yeah. Yeah, Medusa. At a given time. Yeah. Yeah. Of so. Little... So, so a single, it's, a, it's amazing, like when you start multiplying it up, right? Like a single planula can become a dozen polyps and then that can become, you know, suddenly a single polyp is reduced responsible for 144 easily ephyra. And so you get this incredible system. And even worse, I'm learning more frequently that they can stay there for years and just hang out and wait in the shadows. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're like trees, right? They <laughs> they just blossom every year. They're so, and do they do they strobilate more than once a year, or do you have do you know? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I suspect so. Like in the lab, okay. we get them that strobilate more than once. Um, I, I think a lot of the strobilation events in our area relates to like the the first spring warm temperatures. So the first long prolonged like. It, so some years in March, we get like a week or two where we get those 80 or 90s and the water warms up quickly. Then it seems like we get jellies early that year. Um, but it, it seems like we get maybe two or three pulses of them um, throughout the summer. So there's always some that are sort of in that phase of reproduction, but I think there's several sort of peaks that happen. But it's not well documented. Yeah, I mean, I feel like the fact that you guys know that much about your system is amazing because it's in most places, in most places, people don't even know where the polyps are, right? Like, yeah, that's the, that's a huge problem. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I know in the Gulf of Mexico, I don't think very many people, I think in Texas, nobody knows where the polyps are. <laughs> you know, there it's just, it's like this huge mystery and it's such an important part of their life cycle. Mm -hmm. so. Sorry to cut you off from the clean jellyfish discussion because that's where you were headed with the not knowing where the polyps are. So just to get you back on track because I derailed you. Um, so the, for those of you who don't know, there's another jellyfish that y'all keep seeing in the news, a clean jellyfish. So 
um, yeah, it's pretty toxic. Paul, you want to touch on that one? <laughs> yeah. So, you know, this is one that, you know, after Barcelona, um, we had people that were like, hey, have you ever seen these little clinging jellies in New Jersey? Um, and I'm like, no. And they're like, well, you know, they're, you know, they, they're in grass beds. And again, I had spent, I still work in seagrass beds. So I've been in, you know, working in eelgrass beds in Barnegat for 15 years. Never have I ever seen one of these, N not a clue. And so we're like, um, yeah, we'll we'll try to look for it. And literally, like the the plane the plane just barely touched down back in New Jersey, and I I get this um, this call from Jenkinson's Aquarium that this guy that was like fishing in the Manasquan Canal found this weird jellyfish and had the foresight to scoop it up and get it. Um, and then took it over to Jenkinson's. They called me like, do we? And I'm like, I can't believe it. This is something that uh. we just about to go look for and it found us wow um, and so that was like our, our first and then the the big step from that one is that there was a young kid young kid 19 years old up in the shrewsbury so it's another sort of estuary uh slightly further north in new jersey um who got stung oh um and he spent two days in the hospital on like a morphine drip oh gosh from the pain and that's really what sort of like catapulted a lot of the news stories about uh, the clingers and and what was going on in New Jersey. Um, and like the we were out with um, NBC News, um, and they were kind of interviewing this guy. And Dean is like looking over the 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 edge of the bulkhead, and and there's a couple little guys just swimming right there while the reporters are there. Like, hey, we caught these. These are and you know, and that sort of amazing part of the the, the interest. Um, but these guys have these incredible paralysis toxins. So it's like, you know, full body Charlie horse. Um, and that the sting, and again, we have not been stung. Um, we carry sting no more. The stuff that Angel, you know, produced for the, the Pacific box jellies. Um, but it's like you get stung and it's not that bad. And it's hours later that the pain just intensifies as the paralysis toxins go in. So, um, you know, it, it's a very unusual sting from everything that people talk about. And I've been stung by a lot of jellies. You know, intense pain initially, and then it sort of wears down. This one is like, eh. And then hours later, wow. the, the pain just keeps rising and rising. And that's when people are sort of moving into seeking medical treatment because the, of incredible pain. Yeah. Ugh. Well, and this jelly has a really interesting history. It was it was seen in Woods Hole, right, like a hundred years ago, and they described it, and it was you know like found among the grasses in in Eel Pond, which is sort of the pond that Woods Hole in Massachusetts, where a lot of marine biologists hang out all the time. Um, you know, it was described from there, but it, and then at that point, it wasn't known to be a very bad stinger at all, and then it wasn't seen for a long, long time. And then it like reappeared, right? It, the way I understand it, it reappeared like 15 years ago, but the reappearance of it has come with this horrible sting. And then now it looks like it's not well, just in Eel Pond anymore. Yeah, well, um, I'm not entirely convinced uh -huh. that, that that's the way that it all worked. Yeah. Um, because you know, some of the people in Woods Hole, you know, in, in that area say that they've been stung by it and it's not that bad. So uh -huh. we think that there, you know, had to be an introduction a century ago that that's the one that was there, but that that's, you know, maybe the one that still resides in that Massachusetts area. Um, and, and Dina, maybe you can talk to sort of the genetics because you did that part as your dissertation. Um, the differences between sort of the, the Massachusetts and the Connecticut and the New Jersey populations, ours are different. Oh. Um, and um, so I'll, I'll yeah. Dina, you want to talk about that. I, you did all the work. Sure. So um, we actually went in, we went up to Woods Hole, we sampled in Woods Hole, we went and we sampled in Connecticut, and then we went and sampled in the Shrewsbury and obviously in Barnegat. And we were expecting it to look like the species had just sort of hopped down from New England, you know, Massachusetts to Connecticut, Connecticut to New Jersey. 
And when I actually went in and looked at the microsatellites, which are sort of these regions within the DNA that don't necessarily make a protein. So they're variable because there's no pressure to keep them the same. And when I went and looked at them, I was like, we don't, we don't match New England. We are looking more like, you know, species that they have in Europe or species that they had in Asia. So that potentially could be why our sting was a lot worse than what people had been previously reporting in New England. So there was likely a second introduction that had come. So what they had in New England originally was not a severe sting. And then, you know, 15, 25 years ago, this other introduction happened and those were the ones that stung and really created the problem. That's so fascinating. And I feel like that's a really interesting thing about jellyfish, right? Is like, they're so transportable because these planulae, like, and also even the polyps can be transported in, in ballast water pretty easily. And so if they, and that's what happened with, you know, the comb jellies for whatever, for whoever hasn't really read the book yet, <laughs> but that's what happened with the comb jellies in the Black Sea was they were transported from New England and ended up, or from somewhere along the East Coast of the United States and ended up in the Black Sea where they didn't have a predator. And we've seen that like Turtopsis, which is the immortal jellyfish, it's all over the world now, probably from ballast water. So jellyfish are like super transportable, which is another one of their superpowers, I guess. <laughs> Yeah. Well, they've been around, you know, a half a billion years and they'll be, they'll still be here when we're gone as a species, when we finally, no question. Well, the jellies will still be here. Yeah, for sure. For sure. So that, I love how all the magic that's happened, everyone's just going in so many directions and it's so, all this information is stuff that we don't often get to in our talks and introductions and press releases, because we're just trying to introduce the idea. So this is, just such a beautiful opportunity. Um, we do have a question that's like the kind of the, the question of, of everyone asks it basically. And uh, basically what is the, how much strength do you need to uh, dislodge the polyp from a bulkhead? Uh, this question came in back when we were talking about scrubbing. Yeah, I'm not the one to answer that question. <laughs> I, I, mean, I don't know the answer to that question. Enough to make it happen. Um, <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, a lot of polyps, if it's truly the polyp stage, you know, you start to blow them and you're going to, at a minimum, you're just going to tear them apart. So, you know, I, I firmly believe that just physically scrubbing, if they've got the live polyps, that's going to tear them apart. Because when I'm in my tank and I've got them in, in the aquaria, you know, scrubbing them along kind of disrupts them and kind of tears them apart. Um, again, they are, they're not, they're not well put together. They're not, you know, they're not real. I mean, they're just little sacks of goo. Um, now the pot assists, I don't know how much force it would take. Um, but the, the idea of using sort of a pressure washer ought to dislodge those as well, because you're kind of cleaning things off. Um, so they're cemented in pretty well to kind of withstand that pressure. Um, the, the, the living polyps, uh, you know, I, I think just literally a scrub brush would disrupt them and, and tear them apart based on sort of what I see at, at just, you know, how finicky they are in the lab sometimes at, at being disrupted. Awesome. Thanks for answering that question. I know you, we get that a lot as a part of, as all of us are part of that team. Um, but there's two concepts that were brought up that, Julie, that you wrote about in the book that I found really interesting. And I, it's such an important opportunity to, with all of these amazing people to talk with it um, openly. Um, you discuss uh, this um, process that happens when jellyfish are dying. They release a goo, which I assume Paul knows all about this, but maybe just hasn't had the chance to tell all the rest of us because you're too busy doing the introduction of, of jellyfish, but that they release this goo and that um, when this goo is released into the water, it encourages bacteria growth from the sugars and, and organic matter that the jellyfish is releasing. And when I read that passage, I was like, oh my God, we're doing all this really important work, specifically in the Toms River, which is our largest sub watershed in Barnegat Bay, where we're looking at um, an overabundance of pathogen uh, pollution, which of course contains bacteria. And so uh, we do know that jellyfish thrive in Tom's River as well. And so I was wondering between the two of you, if you could expand on that a little bit, if there's really any basis in, 
in going down, having that conversation more often, or if it really just isn't enough in, in estuary habitats, like if the bacteria that's, you know, being encouraged to grow is, is not significant. I don't, you know, the passage in the book was short, but I was like, oh my God, alarm bells. We need to talk about this because we are discussing bacteria in Barnegat Bay um, as a source of pollution. That's definitely for Paul. It's more like, I mean, one in one note I can, I, I'll just say, which is kind of cool, is that when, when you have a huge bloom and it dies, and this is more in the open ocean, then this jellyfish will fall to the bottom of the sea. And this is the same for things called salps, which are another kind of gelatinous creature that forms big contingents, blooms. And um, there's, there's some recent calculations that it's actually a significant kind of carbon sequestration. Um, when, these, when these big blooms die and then fall to the deep sea, you pull a bunch of carbon down. And it actually it was part, is part of the carbon budget for the ocean that people haven't really uh, taken as seriously as they probably should because it can be significant. So that's just like a neat uh, idea that, that that actually research was done after I published the book, but um, but it's 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 kind of a cool concept. Um, jellyfish, yeah, they're super sugary. Their mucus is super sugary, so it's food for bacteria and how that contributes to local ecosystems, that's definitely not that's for you guys. I would love to hear more about that. Um, so do you want the good news or the bad news? <laughs> the good news is, is we don't have that many jellies. On the order of like what you're talking about, Julie, I mean, these are like when you get, you know, hundreds of thousands of them together and then doing, that is the huge fall. Right. We have quite a few jellies. We do not see, you know, we, again, if you, and, and like you, I have jellyfish and jellyfish blooms on Google searches as well. <laughs> you know, all every day reading the new articles that came through, um, as well as my own name. Yes, I'm going <laughs> there to see when somebody talks about me. Um, apparently, I'm also a wine broker in New Orleans. Who knew? It's not so bad. It's kind of a good alter ego. <laughs> like, <laughs> um, but, you know, we don't see these hundreds of thousands of jellies washing up on our shore. So, yes, I'm sure that they're contributing to sort of the aspects of the food web as they die, especially in the fall and, and go down into um, the bottom. I, they're just not at that level. Um, I think that we would need to really worry about them from a, a bacterial perspective. Um, if all of a sudden we were looking at, you know, just thousands and thousands in those lagoons, maybe it's a different thing, all those adults dropping out, um, but it's not nearly as bad a problem. I mean, it's a big problem. I'm not, that's, that's the bad news. Um, but the good news is it's not the level that really moves up to those other aspects. If we don't start to address it, it might be someday, but. That was some, that was so interesting when I read that. I, my alarm bells were like, oh my God, I need to ask that um, on the Zoom call. And then the second thing that I found really interesting, um, Julie, was when you talked about uh, the Ch uh, Chesapeake Bay, because uh, that's our neighbor bay, right? And so the process of overabundance of jellyfish happened there first, to my understanding. And then, you know, they have found ways to, deal with their problems by lowering their nutrient abundance in the water and things like that. But uh, you mentioned that they, in the Chesapeake Bay, the nettles uh, will eat the oyster um, larvae, but then spit it back out. Yeah. And I was like, that. first of all, that's super cool. Um, second of all, I thought that that was a really interesting thing to expand on because in Barnegat Bay, our oyster industry is growing, our, um, our wild oysters are harder to find. I know that people know where they are, so I'm not arguing that there's none, but there's very, very few compared to what there used to be in the way of wild oyster reefs. Um, but the uh, commercial uh, oyster agriculture is growing. So we have more and more farmers out there, you know, um, growing oysters in cages and things. And so uh, if you could first expand on that, and maybe obviously if Paul has something to add, just talking about uh, how the jellyfish may not be impacting that particular animal, which could be a really good thing. 
Yeah, I mean, so the, you know, I, I just reported on what was written in the science, so I didn't see it happen, but it's interesting, like you think of jellyfish as not having maybe so much selectivity when they're out there eating, but actually they, they're, not, you know, they're very, they're, they're, they have a lot going on, you know, like they, they know what they like to eat and what they don't like to eat, they'll spit out. Um, there was a guy who I spoke with and I can't remember how much of his stuff ended up in the book, but he worked on these in the, he was a retired man, gentleman, and he had like a house on this um, tidal pond up in uh, British Columbia. And he got really interested. There were lots of moon jellies there, which are the ones with the, um, the four leaf kind of clover on the back. And he created, he made himself this sort of like glass bottom viewing system. And he would just go and look at the jellies all the time out on, on his boat. And then he would start bringing stuff with him from his kitchen and just see if the jellies would eat it. <laughs> and so he'd be like, he threw like cereal in and peas and um, what else did he tell me? Like all, yeah, oats, you know, all kinds of stuff. And he would just like throw it in the water and see if he could get these like moon jellies to eat it. And he said they ate almost everything. He could get them to eat colored paper, and like, you know, but some things he would throw in and then they, they would spit it out. And so I think they're, they are selective and, um, and they definitely have, yeah, the ability to, to respond to whatever they, their stinging cells attach to and then feed up into their mouth. So they're not, you know, they're not just vacuum cleaners. They're, they're, um, they're animals and so they have they have senses and they they make decisions um so yeah i don't know the specifics of whether they would eat the, the villagers the the baby the baby oysters in barnegat bay but um it's a good question and be a really nice experiment for some master student to work on so <laughs> So, you know, I, I haven't done this myself, but I, I think that it has been done where the, the comb jellies, they show will actively eat them, um, but they don't digest them. But oh. by passing it through their digestive system, it's enough to kill them. So even though they don't really get any nutrition, they're, they're eating some of these, these bivalve larvae. Um, just the process of them going through their digestive system often kills them at that end point. So um, nettles love those comb jellies. Um, okay. And so they, you know, maybe there's an indirect positive benefit of, of having nettles in an area uh, if it eliminates the comb jellies that might be feeding on oyster larvae. Um, well, yeah, I think that's exactly what happened in the Chesapeake, now that you just said that, because I couldn't, I couldn't remember the paper exactly, but I think it's right. When the nettle showed up, they took down the comb jelly population. That allowed the larvae to live longer, and so then that could help establish those, those oyster beds there. I think that's exactly what did happen. Um, yeah, um, that, that makes yeah. sense. Yeah. So, but th but those are some some gray areas of 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 science that need to be better investigated. Because um, the nettles, as far as we can tell, at least in Jersey, they don't have any predators really. They don't have any competitors. They're kind of like the great white sharks. They're the, an apex predator in the system. Um, and uh, unlike the Chesapeake, they don't cause the 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 trophic cascade. So in the Chesapeake, when the nettles are there, the, the um, comb jellies die off and then the copepods re rebound. For us, they eat the copepods as well as the comb jelly. So we do not see that, you know, recovery. Yeah. Um, they eat everything. Um, and, you know, we argued, again, this is the, the joys of trying to publish things. Um, in one of our first papers, we argued that they were very similar to an invasive species. The because they, because what happens for us is not the same. And we couldn't get it through the literature because it was still considered the sea nettle, Chrysara quincacera. Um, but then after Keith Bea, like redid the taxonomy and put it at Chesapeake, we have Chesapeake eye. But I can go back into the old literature. There's no record 
of nettles in Barnegat Bay um, from the surveys that were done in the early 1900s, in the 1920s and 1930s, even into the 1960s. There's like no real record of these things being there. And it's only into the 80s and 90s that we get this explosion of what is technically the bay nettle, the Chesapeake eye. Um, so it doesn't look like New Jersey really had them. And that the reason that they act differently, it's like they're an invasive species and non-native um, that got transported from the Chesapeake up to New Jersey at some point. Why this are they- Blake Kent Montford. Huh, that's fascinating. I wonder why they're not, so that you're, in the Chesapeake, they don't like to eat copepods very much, but they do in New Jersey. Yeah, but, but that's, so in, in the Chesapeake, we see the, the, the trophic cascade where boom, yeah. boom, and then you get a response. Um, in ours, when the nettles are abundant, the coat, yeah, I mean, those comb jellies drop dramatically, but so do the copepods as wow. soon as they come up. That, I mean, they're so hard to understand. I feel like they're just, that they're just such fascinating animals. So reading your book, I, uh, of course, I, I know a little bit. I have a degree in marine biology for whatever that's worth. Um, oh. you, there was so much more in this book <laughs> that I was like, Jellyfish are, they, there were so many things. There's like that they have um, symbiotic algae. I guess I might have been told that a long time ago that they can harbor uh, fish underneath of their bells to like protect them. And, you know, that they actually, I thought they reproduced two different ways. They actually reproduced four different ways. Like, or more. <laughs> like, I thought I knew things about the jellyfish. I was like, I've got like a basic understanding. <sighs> Not even close. Um, <laughs> so, um, well, that's how I felt too. I mean, they're just, you know, like Paul said, initially they were sort of just neglected for so long and, and they're so amazing. And so you can get a whole marine biology degree and not know anything about, that. I mean, that's exactly what happened for me too. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And I, I have, pro I could probably dominate this call with questions for you, but Christine has a question. Um, so when the jellies are dormant over the winter, are they still feeding and do they drop to the bottom of the bay? So I guess that one's more for Paulo. Yeah. 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 For sure. So, you know, the adults, when they get, when they're done for the season, they're going to die and drop down. Although again, we saw them in late October, big ones still around, which was really late in the season. I think you guys said you saw them on in November. That's really late for these guys to still be around. Um, for the polyps, essentially, if they're in polyp form, they're not, they're not surviving the winter. They're not still sort of active. They're all sort of like hunkered down into that podicist level. Um, it's, it's generally too, uh, too cold for them. So that the, you know, being cold blooded, um, their metabolic rate and, and how they function is based on water temperature. So when the water temperature is really down, they don't need much energy, they don't use it, they're not very active. So even if they're still around, um, they're really not sort of actively feeding. Um, they're sort of like kind of drawn in um, across the winter. Um, but nobody's looked for them. Are they still there in January and February? Nobody wants to be in the water looking for them um, at those stages to actually know that answer. Um, but with some of the people that have all those settling plates out, Maybe we can have some of the folks, you know, haul them up in January and we can do in January, we can do sort of a, uh, another sort of, you know, open access day and bring the microscopes and look and see what we actually see on some of those, uh, some of those plates. So just as a quick little um, tidbit, uh, Save Barnegat Bay cut up old rain barrel tops. So when I cut out rain barrels, I cut out the tops of the barrels and I've been saving them like a crazy person in the basement and everyone at Save Running Bay is like, why are you saving this garbage? Well, this jellyfish project started and I was like, I have a whole lot of plastic that I've been waiting to reuse for some reason. So we cut it into small little pieces and strung it on fishing line and handed it out to folks and said, hang this on your bulkhead and bring it back to us uh, for an observation day that Brittany runs. And uh, look at it under a microscope. And we had two of those. Um, Brittany, do you want to just quickly go over what we did there? 
Yeah, so we invite the community scientists who have the settling plates back to uh, Berkeley's dive house, and we have a micro microscope station set up. We had Paul at the first one, and then we had students and Dr. John Winnick from Mates, the uh, Marine Academy for uh, Technology and Environmental Science. That's the high school that we're also partnering with. Uh, they kind of ran the microscope station, and they got to actually look at the uh, settling plates under a microscope and start to identify the different creatures that are growing. Um, on the plates and show the homeowners exactly what is probably growing, what's definitely growing on the plates and what's most likely growing on their bulkheads. So you can actually identify polyps and show uh, the community who's so concerned about jellyfish those polyps and they get an idea of like what they're looking for and why why these polyps are so important and how what how that all interacts with the jellyfish life cycle and so on. So it's a really cool project. A lot of people are excited. Um, I think we have about 70, last time I checked, uh, people all across Barnegat Bay. Wow, Battling that's out fantastic. Of yeah, yeah, it's a really cool uh, program. It's my favorite part, the community science <laughs> aspect and getting people excited to learn more about jellyfish. Uh, it's really cool. I like it a lot. Amazing. I'm excited to see what happens with all of that. I mean, to do a mapping project also will be really interesting, right? If there's places where you have higher densities or lower density, you know, it'll be very fascinating. Yeah, definitely. So um, there's one more thing from the book that I wanted to touch on uh, that you mentioned. It's actually referencing Dina's uh, pro, um, work, uh, talking about, you know, we talk about jellyfish and the, and the things that eat them. And I often get people confused because they go, well, don't sea turtles eat them? And I'm learning now that birds eat them. And then, so what I try to explain to folks is that in the Bay Estuary, you know, while sea turtles have been seen in here, there's certainly not enough of them. And they're certainly not going into those back lagoons to hang out and, you know, have a snack time. Um, so when we talk about predators, ocean predators versus estuary predators, they're a little bit different, right? So um, but there is one predator that you both, Julie, you've referenced it in your book, and uh, Paul, you've taught me in the past. Um, there's this nudibranch, which for those of you who don't know, it's basically a slug or a, a snail rather without a shell. That's like the very basic elementary way of describing it. They can be really beautiful and colorful. Um, but there's a nudibranch that eats the polyp stage, right? So Julie, if you want to mention the piece from your book, and then we can expand on that. Well, I, I mean, this is really Dina's work. So I, I mean, I cribbed off her for my, for the story. <laughs> it was just so fascinating to me because yeah, I, I think I mentioned one of the, one of the crazy things is we don't know, we know hardly anything about polyps and there's maybe two dozen species that people have even seen the polyps of in the wild. And, and I think, you know, depending on how you count how many species of jellyfish there are, there's I don't know, between two and 4,000, depending on how many groups you want to put in. So there's thousands of species of jellyfish. We know, we've seen about two dozen species of wild polyps. And that has always kind of made my head hurt. Like, what is going on there? And Dina had this amazing idea, which is um, to look at the nudibranchs, which eat the jellyfish polyps to kind of help figure out where the polyps might live. And, and I just had never, because the nudibranchs are easier to find than the polyps in general. I mean, they're, they're bigger. And, um, and so I just, I put that in my book because I thought it was brilliant. So I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> and let Dina talk about her work. <laughs> so. Would you mind, Dina, could you just briefly explain Sure, sure. So, I mean, Julie definitely hit on what we were doing, um, but I was, I think we were actually down the shore one day working on the bay and I was like, you know, we call Paul B in the lab. And I was like, I, I think I want to like look at the nudibranchs and see if I can get them to, um, like if I can get jellyfish DNA out of them. And we go back and forth with whose like brainchild this was at what point. <laughs> But um, I was, he was like, "All right, fine. Let's. Well, we get. I'll, I'll give it credit to you." <laughs> so I was like, "All right." I'm you know. an old white guy. There needs to be more people that are not like me that are experts, and so I will defer to you. So uh, we would occasionally get these nudibranchs up on settling plates, and we harvested the nudibranchs. And what they do, and we actually have footage of this, is they cruise around the settling plates or on the bulkhead, any substrate that sort of in the bay 
And when they come across a polyp, so it could be a bay nettle polyp, it could be other hydrozoans on the plate, they literally just come along and they munch on it. And the cool thing that they're capable of doing is instead of just breaking it down and digesting it, they're actually capable of taking the stinging cells and transporting them into what sort of looks like little frills or little fingers on their back. And then they use the stinging cell from the jellyfish to protect themselves. So there's some debate about whether jellyfish DNA comes along with that stinging cell all the way up into those appendages on their back, or if it just stays within the digestive tract. We've been able to get the DNA from both places, but there's some belief about whether or not that really happened, but we think that you can get it. Um, but it's pretty cool because you can sort of backdoor finding the polyps if you don't know where they are. So the nudibranchs that we have in the bay are very small, you know, maybe a centimeter. So if you can find that, you know, they're not transversing these big distances to go and have a snack. They're going to be in one area and you should be able to sort of say, hey, if I can get this jellyfish's DNA here, I know that I have polyps in this region. So it's sort of a reverse way of figuring out where you can find the polyps by finding these sea slugs, which are just a little bit bigger. And are the are the nudibranchs tolerant to those low oxygen conditions like the like are would they be found in the same places or are they going to be found on the more outskirts where the water quality is better of the lagoons? So they're I wouldn't say as tolerant of low oxygen, but they are feeding on the jellyfish polyps. So they're going to be more tolerant than I would say like fish are in general. Yeah, and, and I'll follow up a little bit. Um, so this idea that they're stealing the, it, it's a crazy world. Klepto uh, uh, nittery or nitto klepto, you know. Klepto like, um, Where in some cases what they're doing is they're uh, targeting the immature stinging cells. And that's the ones that they're bringing through and allowing them to mature. So wow, they're- Wow, I didn't know that. That's amazing. So, so there's some potential that, you know, maybe they also have some component of, of the jelly DNA in their DNA to direct sort of the, the, the continuation and the growth of the cells that are inside them. But the, the idea was that, well, if you find them and you grind them up and you use jellyfish specific DNA markers, which is what Dina was doing, that you should be able to. Um, now. So, so you saw that part of it. Um, one of the other parts, which is equally as crazy, is after we got back and we were looking for the clinging jellies, um, we were like, well, I wonder if there's any polyps. And so I had another graduate student, um, Alex, who had done a bunch of settling plate and looking for like nettles to come through. Um, we went through a bunch of his old samples and got the nudibranchs out of there and then Dina started to run it and you know lo and behold we did not find any clinging jelly polyps but what did you find? That clinging jelly DNA. No Whoa. no we did not get that on those. In the oh we got the Mauricia. Oh you're talking about that part. Yeah so we actually found another species that hadn't been documented in the bay. Um, by running its DNA. So, you know, I'm sitting there in the middle of the night looking at all of these blast results, which is just a database of DNA. And I come back and I was like, I have another invasive. And then, you know, hours in the lab later, we actually were able to go back and find what we believe was a similar polyp to this species that we had no clue was existing in the bay, but we found it in more than one place in more than one time. Wow. And, and in the, and in the nudibranch. Yep. So it worked. Yeah, it worked. <laughs> so that, that's so cool. But then, but but going back to the settling plates, looking for little teeny polyps of things like, uh, you know, it's like, you know, hours under the scope, you know, peeling over these things, looking for, you know, these minutiae, like, I don't know, it kind of looks like it. Quick, take a picture of it and we'll run the DNA and see if it matches. And wow. I think you did a bunch of, well, you did a bunch, you did all the work. Um, 
but it was just like, you know, a, a lot of strikes before we got a hit um, that we matched the polyp with the DNA that had come out of the, the new debranks. And have you ever seen Medusa of those jellyfish in the bay? We do, um, but we've, you know, we, we have sort of a more native Mauricia. Um, this is, so we've never broken down the Medusa that we found. Um, we may have some that are in the works because we're doing some other genetic stuff um, with the, the, the project affiliated with the power plant. Um, uh -huh. So we may still get some of that information out of there, but um, I don't know that we've ever seen any um, any Medusa that we've identified. Dina, can you think? I never ID'd a Mercy Anchormanica. Wow. That's so, so cool. So we just found the polyps. So if your polyps are there, then you're going to have yeah. Medusa at some point. It's just that, you know, they might not be as abundant as some of the other species, so we're not seeing them, but that doesn't mean that they're there. I mean, we've sampled, and you can see jellyfish all around you on the boat, but you're not picking them up in your sample. So that does that does happen. So it doesn't mean right. that they're not there. Yeah. Yeah. So we oh, got that's so cool. <laughs> we got one question on uh, Facebook from Tracy. Are all jellyfish poisonous to us? That's a, Julie, and in your travels, you found some that weren't that lethal, right? Yeah. I, th so like all jellyfish have stinging cells. Like that is, that is the crux of their, of their, uh, ability to survive <laughs> you know they hunt with it and they defend themselves with it um so they all have this they couldn't eat if they didn't have a stinging cell but not all of their stinging cells hurt us very much um some of them we can't feel very much they don't really get through our skin um and some other toxins aren't very strong or don't really affect us very much so they all do sting but they don't all really hurt us um, but some of them hurt us a whole lot. And um, yeah, they're all different. And, and it, this is another piece of the jellyfish world that really hasn't had, I mean, there's so much more to learn. Um, Angel Yanagahara, who Paul mentioned, has done a ton of work on jellyfish stings, especially some of the more toxic box jelly stings. And I mean, the proteins that she pulls out of those, the, the, the stinging cells are, there's like 400 of them per stinging cell. I mean, there's just like a completely, um, a huge amount of chemistry <laughs> that the jellyfish are doing. And um, and we, and then the, what happens is you can look at two different jellyfish and the, the proteins uh, in their stinging cells don't overlap very much at all. So, so it's not just a single species that's doing a lot of chemistry, like each individual species is doing a ton of chemistry. So there's a lot that we don't understand about jellyfish stinging cells and toxins and protein, the proteins that they use to do what they do to their prey. No, I'm not sure whether they were also asking comb jellies, which are not oh, sorry, jellyfish, yeah, the they don't have stinging cells and salps, which are closely related to you and I, they don't have stinging cells, only sort of the true jellies do. Yeah. Yeah, we, we talk about comb jellies and I think people mix, I mean, we, we call them jellies and it's offhand, right? And people yeah. often think salps are jellyfish eggs. Like there's a lot of confusion because if you're not in it, right? Like if you're not one of us constantly working on these things, these things can be confusing and maybe a little bit intimidating if you're seeing them in large mass, right? In the water, um, in the bay or in the ocean or th things like that. So hopefully continued education, we can sort all that out. <laughs> Um, does anyone else have any questions for our, this has been magical. This has been <laughs> so amazing. I loved your book. So I was so excited to hear from you, Julie. And then just having Paul and Dina here has just been awesome. Um, for me too. It's been a total gift to have you guys here on this call to talk to. I love it. I didn't get to my limericks. So at some point. <laughs> oh, give us one. We had so much. We had so much fun. Give us um, one. Okay. Well, uh, okay, well, this is, but Paul and Dana can't, no, none of you jellyfish experts can answer this, but this should be really easy from, from all we've been talking about. Um, 
Jellies start life as a dollop, so small its form might call up a shrimp sized knickknack or a furry tic tac, which next turns into a. Someone on mute. <laughs> <laughs> Polyp. Polyp, yes. I knew you were going to do it, Jim. I could see it on your face. Coming out. <laughs> I love your t-shirt. What do you have there, Jim? What t-shirt you got there? Something jellies. No more jellies in Barnegat Bay. Oh, wow. Who made that t-shirt? We did years ago. Oh, it's vintage. Jim, you're muted. You got to unmute. Britta nailed it. This was done by St. Barnegat Bay many years ago. Ah, that's so cool. Oh, wow. I, I have, have my one. big giant green flag. Yes. Which does the same thing. Mine's a nightshirt now. It's so old. <laughs> yeah. It's a real collector's item now. Yeah, totally. <laughs> oh, I that's love awesome. that stuff. Thanks for sharing that, Jim. So I, I want to follow up on one thing. When you were talking about, are there any jellyfish predators? You know, the sea turtles aren't inside here. Um, for the last several years, we've had ocean sunfish, mola mola. Oh, no way! In Barnegat Bay. No way! You know, That's uh, so yeah. cool! Um, and, cool. and people have, like, you know, got them on video. Some kid caught one while he was fishing off of his dock. And they're like, what the heck is this thing? Um, so uh, we've actually had them in the bay, ostensibly looking for jellies, I would suspect. Um, I don't know why they would swim into the bay. So for anyone who doesn't know, the mola mola are the largest bony fish in the ocean and they like google go ahead and google it because they're amazing they look so bizarre they look like a yeah yeah <laughs> they look like no other fish um and they're amazing and they're they eat jellyfish almost I, entirely i think um and the other thing to google is larva mola mola larva or and they look like a christmas ornament Look at that thing! Is that the cutest? <laughs> so they are super cute. They kind of remind me of baby trunk fish. Which I are mean, also they're just amazing. <laughs> they're just adorable. <laughs> really? So they're major jellyfish eaters, and they grow so big on jellyfish. So it's it's hard to conceptualize like how many jellyfish they must have to eat to get so big. <laughs> How do I? That's so cool. You guys have them there. I didn't think they got that far north. I thought they were more. They do. Yeah. I've heard of them being in the Bay. I mean, we don't have mountains of them, right? But we do have yeah. sightings of them, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like, but, but it's, it's, uh, again, for the last several years, there's been sightings of them. And some of them is like, oh my God, there's a big shark in the bay. Because, you know, when they're in yeah. shallow water, that fin sticks out of the water and, and people kind of get them confused. Um, but there was, I think it was maybe two or three years ago where it just seemed like either it was the same mola mola that showed up all over the place and was <laughs> videoed, or there was a bunch of them that came in um and and we're just kind of like swimming around the bay now these were not big adults they were you know maybe a foot in, in size maybe a little bit bigger um, okay. but um still relatively unique to kind of see them in the bay swimming around so cool that's amazing what fun so does anyone else have any questions for our amazing group of people here I know we've been, we've had a few stragglers that pop in here and there. Well, I will, um, if anyone can think of anything, I'll just do a little wrap up here for a sec and then we can uh, let the, the amazing people that stayed on for so long um, go. And then if there's any last little stragglers, we'll catch them in the end here. But um, I just want to say thank you so much, Julie, for one, dedicating six years of your life to jellyfish, right? <laughs> and, and building this beautiful piece of artwork and your writing and capturing the story of both the jellyfish and bringing us through the story of your adventure personally and professionally. I think that really, it made it for me anyway. Um, oh, so I, 
Yeah, thank you for being here tonight and being a part of our little book club. And for those of you who haven't read Julie's book, I highly, highly recommend it. Um, it's really very, it's a really easy and good read. Um, I'm putting the link here in the chat uh, so that you can find Julie's website and purchase the book and um, uh, read it if you haven't yet. Um, but of course, we love to tie our books into our work here at Save Barnegat Bay um, that we're doing with the book club. So uh, of course, I need to invite Brittany to talk about some of the things that all of you here on this call can do to be a part of the work being done in Barnegat Bay to do with jellyfish. So uh, as you all already know, we've only done two Saturdays worth of scrubbing um, thus far. So we're at the very beginning of this. So you're not late to the game. You can still get some settling plates and sign up for scrubbing, but I'm gonna let Brittany tell you all about all the ways that you can get involved with our work. Okay, so first and foremost, um, we are doing scrubbing currently in Berkeley Shores. Uh, we're gonna be finishing up this winter season and starting again um, early spring. So if you are a Berkeley Shores resident living on a lagoon and have a bulkhead, preferably a vinyl bulkhead, but we're doing them all, um please uh email me i will put my give me one second i will put my email in the chat right now it's very easy it's just jellyfish at save barnegat bay.org and um if you live in the toms river or brick region um over the next two years we will be expanding our scrubbing uh program over there so we might be in a lagoon near you so if you, <laughs> uh, here's my email for that. And to uh, get on our uh, Stop the Sting email list, you can fill out the form on our website, which is right here. There's the link to that. To uh, be part of our settling play program or community science program, all you gotta do is live by the water and live in Barnegat Bay. So you can email me to sign up for that. Or again, uh, fill out our form on my, on our landing page website. Um, what else? To check out our podcast and to learn more about Jellyfish and other programs that we are doing at Save Barnegat Bay, you could check out our Instagram. We have um, a whole page dedicated to links in our bio. Uh, you could check out our Facebook page. And if you don't live in a lagoon um, on the water, you can contribute to uh, Lessing or lessening nutrient pollution in Barnegat Bay by not using fertilizer um, on your lawns. So uh, I think I got everything. Mm -hmm. And Grace Ann just has a link to our podcast there too. I Thank found you. it on Google, which I don't, not sure. Google, I guess, drags in information from all these other places. But um, if you enjoy listening to podcasts, we just finished an episode called Stop the Sting. Um, you can listen on uh, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and uh, Anchor. Yep, yeah, Avery put the nicer link there. <laughs> <laughs> That's the much cleaner looking thing. Um, so yeah, definitely stay in touch with all the work that we're doing and um, definitely read Julie's book and uh, stay in touch with the work that Paul is doing too. Uh, Paul tends to end up in the news quite often <laughs> and in newspapers and stuff. So just search Paul Bologna. Um, New Jersey, whatever, and jellyfish, and you'll find all kinds of news articles and clips of Paul talking on TV and stuff for all the updates about all the work we're doing in Barnegat Bay over the past few years. So, yeah, I think, did we forget anything? Anyone? Can I, can I make one more plug? Of course, absolutely. Yeah. I have another book coming out in April, and it's, so it's called, that's the one called Life on the Rocks, um, and it's about coral. Um, so coral are jellyfish first cousins, and as y'all know, the coral situation is, it's concerning. Um, so uh, I, I um, it's not an obituary yet, but it definitely, um, it's definitely concerning. And, um, and there's, it's kind of the same idea, similar structure where I talk a lot about how cool coral are, and co coral science is amazing. It's, incredibly, it's just as amazing as jellyfish. <laughs> um, you know, they build these incredible limestone structures around the world and the way they do it is through solar power, which is, it kind of blows your mind. 90% of the energy they get comes from their symbiotic algae. So 
Um, and, then, and then I go around the world and I look at places where coral reefs are doing okay or people are doing work to keep coral alive and, um, and understand more about um, what's gonna happen in a future hotter ocean. So uh, April 6th is the, is the pub date and I'm, I'm really excited about it. Uh, unfortunately, my copy of the book's downstairs, but uh, it has a beautiful, a beautiful bouquet of coral on the front. So. I will be sure to look out for that for sure. That's yes. awesome. Thank you for telling us about that. Sure. And uh, yeah, you all got to put that date on your calendar. Mm -hmm. we'll be, well, this group of 15 people will be the first ones to buy it, right? All right. Or invite yeah. me back next year for your friend of a club. <laughs> yes. <laughs> or a couple of years later. <laughs> I love it. No, no. Thank you so, so much for being here and your enthusiasm and your willingness to come and talk with us here in Barnegat Bay. Thank you so, so much. And thank you to all. Of, thank you, Paul, for tuning in, obviously, yes. and Dina for contributing so much always and being a part of all this in into the night at all the time. <laughs> so, so, Julie, I have one quick question. Um, we had a uh, somebody who used to work at the university, but it has since taken a position elsewhere, who was in Texas and uh, sent pictures of a house. Uh, you're in Austin, is that right? Yeah. Um, that the uh, exterior was uh, extravagantly decorated with jellies. Would that be you? Is the outside? Oh. Of the Does it have a uh, jelly swag? No. So, like I have, I do have like one little jelly piece of art on the door next to my <laughs> doorbell, but that's all I have. <laughs> like, well, I'll have to, I, I'll, I'll have to, uh, to, to ask Gaynor because he says that he he was the one that got the the text image of somebody that was like going in Austin and saw all this jellyfish and knew that we kind of did it. Oh yeah, yeah. I, I need to know about that for sure. I mean, Austin, you know, it's like keep Austin weird is the whole right, thing right. here. So like, I'm not surprised, but I also haven't heard about it, and I should know about that. There's a great beer here if you ever come. It's called the Electric Jellyfish Beer. It's it's actually superb. It's one of the best beers I've ever had. And um, there's a, a local brewery called Pint House that makes it. And so if you ever come to Austin, make sure you get a, get a pint of that. <laughs> so. That is fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Well, and I'll, one last thank you. Thank you to all of you folks that stayed on for an hour and a half because this was a pretty magical conversation, but having you all here is what makes it worth doing. So thank you all our familiar faces and our new faces we hope to see you at our next book club event and uh yeah i think thank you thank you all so much <laughs> have a good night everyone good night all right take care